reading the book of Galatians, the sixth chapter, and just looking at a couple of those verses, verses 14 through 16. Verses 14 through 16. Now, different translations have different ways of um, rendering this text. Um, one translation puts it thus, Far be it for me to boast. If I am to boast, I will boast in the cross of my Lord Jesus Christ. In the New King James Version, it is rendered this way. But God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Whatever translation you have, the message is essentially the same. I have um, traveled around and in so doing, I have met many people. As I engage in a discussion with them, it is very interesting to find the things that people like to boast about. There are those who would boast about their academic achievements in life. They have studied hard. They have gained letters behind their names, and they want you to know that. That's something they like to boast about. There are others who like to boast about the fact that they hold a certain position and status in life. That's what they like to boast about. Others live in a particular area and uh, consider themselves as part of an elite group, and so they like to boast about that. Others have a healthy bank account and are in um, a, a secure place of employment, and, and so they like to boast about that. Others like to boast about the fact that they were born in a particular place, and they take great pride in that. They like to boast about that, as though they had a choice in their place of birth. But this is what they like to boast about. Others have achieved much in their lives, and so they want to boast about their accomplishment. The Apostle Paul, writing here, puts these words together in verse 14. He says, but God forbid that I should boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I unto the world. Paul had much that he could boast about. In fact, if you were to read Paul's resume as outlined in Philippians chapter 3 and verses 5 onwards, you would see there Paul's CV. And it's a very impressive CV too. The historical records tell us that by birth, by religion, education, and by sentiment, that Paul was a Hebrew. And so in spite of the Greek influence and philosophy, in spite of the Roman culture, Paul was able to say that he was a Hebrew of Hebrews. Paul had everything that an Israelite could possibly boast in. And he was conscious and proud of his heritage. He begins in verse 5 
of the, of the book of Philippians chapter 3. He begins by saying that he was circumcised on the eighth day. In other words, Paul wasn't a convert to Judaism when he was old. No, he was by birth a part of the covenant promise of God's people. It's interesting, as I talk with individuals and ask them, you know, how long have you been a Christian? How long have you been in the church? Some people will boast and say, oh, well, I was born an Adventist, as though that meant anything. What's more important, it's not so much when, if you were born into the church, is have you experienced the rebirth? Have you a deep and an intimate commitment or a relationship with Jesus Christ? Have you experienced the new birth? Paul could have boasted about the fact that, yes, indeed, he was circumcised on the allotted day that God had prescribed in Scripture. He goes on to say that he was of the stock of Israel, a descendant of Jacob. In fact, Paul wasn't like the other um, Jews who were scattered in the diaspora. Paul knew where he had come from. He could trace his roots right down to the tribe of Benjamin. Paul wasn't one of those Jews who did not know their heritage. Paul knew where he had come from. He, he even could trace his name to the very first king of Israel, Saul. Paul could have boasted in this fact. Whereas others were unable to read the sacred scrolls and manuscript. Paul could have boasted in the fact that he was able to read the Old Testament and was able to expound on these sacred writings. He could have boasted in that fact. Education? Well, Paul was um, tutored by the most renowned rabbi and Pharisee of the day, the great Gamaliel. Paul became such a brilliant scholar, an intellectual. He could have boasted about his scholastic achievements. He was a Pharisee, a member of the Sanhedrin Council, one of the elite, you might say. He could have boasted about that. Paul was an author. If you were to look at the New Testament, and most of the writings of the New Testament was written by this man of God. He could have boasted about the fact that he was a pro prolific writer and a great author. In terms of mission and ministry, Paul was one of the greatest church planters we have in the New Testament going through many places and establishing a number of churches. Paul could have boasted in the fact that he was a great minister. The Spirit of God used him to perform many miracles. He could have boasted in the fact that he had accomplished much. And when you think about Paul's conversion experience, you know, I have listened to people as they have given their testimonies, how they came to know the Lord. And I very often wondered, as listening to people give their testimony, are they lifting up Christ or are they lifting themselves up? Paul met the risen Savior. Paul heard the voice of the risen Savior calling him by name, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Paul had a close and a personal encounter 
with the risen Lord. He could have boasted about that fact that Christ had called him personally to be a, a, a disciple or an apostle to the Gentile. He could have gloried about that. But when I consider all that Paul had achieved and all that Paul had experienced and I read his own testimony, this is what he says. But God forbid that I should boast. If I am to boast, I will boast in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm touched by this. I'm moved by this. What is it about the cross that causes someone who has achieved so much in his life to want to put that to one side and to boast about the cross? The cross was a symbol of shame. The cross was designed for criminals. In fact, the Bible says, cursed is everyone that hangs upon the cross. Yet Paul could say, of all that I have accomplished in this life, of all that I have achieved, I am prepared to put that all to one side and boast in the cross of Calvary. What is it, Paul, about the cross? that causes everything else to just pale into insignificance when you focus on the cross. I'm glad you asked. So let me share two things about the cross of Calvary, after which I will take my seat. The first thing about the cross that causes everything else to pale into insignificance is that the love of God the Father is exhibited in the cross. The love of God the Father is exhibited in the cross. The Bible teaches that the wages of sin is death. If God chose to destroy the, our first parents, if God chose to destroy the human family, he would still be a just God because the wages of sin is death. However, God chose not to, but he demonstrated his love towards us. In fact, when Jesus became man and came into this earth, Satan dogged his every footstep. And as he did so, I want you to picture with me in the Garden of Gethsemane. As our Savior pleads with his close companions and says, stay up and pray with me for a while. The disciples grew tired. Picture with me as Jesus goes a little distant further and as he agonizes with God in prayer as he thinks about this whole plan of salvation he prays this prayer father if it is possible let this cup pass away from me in other words my friends humanly speaking Jesus did not want to go through with it in other words, the pain and the mental anguish and, and all that was involved in it, humanly speaking, Jesus did not want to go through with it. And so he prays, Father, if there is any way of saving the human family without me having to go through this, then let's take that option. The Father had to answer that prayer. The Father looked at you. The Father looked at his only begotten Son. And guess what? The Father chose you. He said, 
as Jesus prayed, if it is possible, let this cup pass away from me. Our salvation, your salvation and my salvation literally trembled in the balances. Because if Jesus decided, well, that's it, I'm not going through with it, where would our salvation be today? But I'm grateful to God that Jesus did not stop there in his prayer. He went on to say, nevertheless, not my will, but let your will be done. It was the will of the Father that Jesus goes through the agony and the pain of the crucifixion and the cross in order to save you and I. Therefore, when I look to the cross of Calvary, the love of God the Father is exhibited there. Picture him as he carries that cross and hangs upon that cruel tree. Picture him as those standing below begin to ridicule and to jeer at him. He saved others. Himself he cannot save. Picture him as those standing below begin to taunt him. Let him come down from the cross now and we will believe him. What a temptation. Because the reality of, it, of, of the fact is Jesus could have come down from the cross. Picture him as he hangs upon that cross. A criminal hangs beside him reaches out to him and says to the Lord, Lord, remember me when you come in your kingdom. Jesus, listening to all the ridicule and the taunts and the jeers, stops dying for a moment, turns to that criminal and says to him, I'm telling you today, you will be with me in paradise. Jesus stops dying to give a criminal the assurance of eternal life. And that's because the Father's love is exhibited in that cross. Oh, my friends, John was so overwhelmed by this love that he wrote, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called sons, yea, children of the Most High God. What a God we serve. When we consider what Jesus is going through, we remind, we remind ourselves of the words of Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I want you to notice, my friends, God doesn't give his son so that you can understand that he loves you. No, he loved you before, and as a demonstration of the love that he has for you, he gives us his son. What a God we serve. And so Jesus as he is hanging upon the cross, the father comes very close. He envelopes himself in thick darkness. In fact, the Bible tells us that there was darkness over Calvary as Jesus hangs upon that cross. Because the father is close to his son, the love of God the father is being exhibited in the cross of Calvary. And as Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus cannot see beyond the portals of the tomb, but is willing to trust in God. Even the angels of God have to veil their faces as Jesus is dying on the cross. Inanimate nature refuses to look upon the scene because the creator is dying upon that cross. My friends, 
when I look at the cross of Calvary, what are the things that I have accomplished in this life in comparison to the love of God the Father as exhibited in the cross of Calvary? Paul, with all that he has achieved in life, would say, but God forbid that I should boast. Far be it for me to boast in anything that I have accomplished. If I am to boast, I will boast in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Everything else simply fades into insignificance. There is another reason why Paul could say that I haven't achieved anything that is worthy to boast about. Yes, firstly, the love of God the Father is exhibited in the cross. But secondly, the love of Jesus is clearly manifested in the cross of Calvary. Jesus says, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. I have read about and seen heroic acts where people have risked their own lives to save others. I have read about people giving up their own lives in order to save others. I know of mothers and parents who will give up everything and sometimes their lives for the sake of their children. But who ever heard of someone giving their lives for enemies? The Bible tells us, the same Paul puts it this way, but God commendeth his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, enmity against God, God died for us. What kind of love is this? For someone to die for their enemies? Who's ever heard of that? And that's what Jesus did. Because as Jesus went to the cross, as those who stood at the foot of the cross ridiculed him, as Jesus had to carry that cruel cross through the streets of Jerusalem, out through the gates, picture him as his arms are stretched out. And as those rusty nails are pounded through his hands and feet, picture as the cross is raised and hoisted into the air, hear the sound as it thuds into the place where it is prepared. Picture and listen to those scorning him. Then listen as Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Imagine as he is crucified naked on that cross. Imagine the shame as people walk by and shake their heads. Imagine Jesus dying for people who are ridiculing him. Imagine. Oh, my friends, when I look at the cross of Calvary, not only do I see the love of God the Father exhibited there, but I also see the love of Jesus manifested there. Because he could not see through the portals of the tomb, he was prepared nevertheless to go through with it if that it, what it costs to save the human family. If it costs an eternal separation from the Godhead, then Jesus says, I am prepared to go through with it. If that's what it's going to cost to save us today, Jesus went through with it. So when I look 
at the cross and consider the love of Jesus as it is revealed in the cross of Calvary. What have I achieved in this life that I could boast about? Greater love hath no man than this, that a man laid down his life for his friends. And Jesus says, you are my friends. Today there is a, a lot going on in the media about the marriage of Prince Harry and uh, Megan, who are due to get married shortly. I haven't received an invitation to that wedding. I don't know whether you have. Uh, maybe I'm not part of that royal elite. But guess what, my friends? You and I have a friend who is much higher than the sovereign of this country. Jesus calls you and I his friends. That makes us special. So I don't know what frame of mind you have come into this sanctuary with. I don't know what your week has been. I don't know the burdens that you are bearing. But this one thing I do know, because of the cross of Calvary, I can declare, based upon the authority of the word of God, God the Father's love is exhibited in that cross. I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt that the love of Jesus is manifested in that cross. I can submit to you this afternoon, you are loved by God Almighty. So let those heavy burdens, leave them at the foot of the cross because you are special in the eyes of God. Thank God for the cross. God forbid that I, or anyone else for that matter, should boast. If we are to boast, let us boast in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ.